938 Live. This is Talkback. Are sanctions really the answer to getting countries that misbehave back in line? Hit a country where it hurts the most, they say. Governments, economies and money are usually the targets of sanctions that are imposed on a country. But how effective really are they when they are imposed? Do they effectively get governments, regimes or even dictatorships to change their policies? Or do sanctions just hurt the ordinary citizens of the country? 669-11938 is our number. Give us a ring or start talking to us on Facebook official 938 Live. Now, the downing of Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 refocused the world's attention on the Ukraine crisis and the position that Russia has taken on the And this is after its annexation of Crimea in March. Now, pro-Russian separatists are being blamed for the downing of the passenger plane on the 17th of July, killing all 298 passengers and crew. The US and the EU have pointed their fingers at Mr. Vladimir Putin for supplying heavy weapons to separatist rebels. But of course, the Russians deny the charge. Now, both have introduced sanctions that target Russia's banking, defense and energy sectors. The EU has also included the oil sector, defense equipment and sensitive technologies. The bloc also announced it was imposing sanctions on several members of Mr. Putin's inner circle. The G7, which includes US, Germany, Britain, France, Italy, Canada and Japan, have also warned the Russians that they could face even further economic sanctions should they continue to support the separatist rebels in Ukraine. All this is with the hope of making Russia pay a price for the crisis, pressuring Moscow to support a peaceful resolution of the crisis. So how will Russia bow to pressure from the West, even as its banking system already feels the effects of eu asset freezes and travel bans on 95 people and 23 entities. How will a run of investments from Russian markets affect the livelihoods and jobs of ordinary Russians? So are sanctions the way to go for Russia? You can call us to talk to us at 669-11938. Joining us over the phone is TV Paul. He is Professor of International Relations at the Department of Political Science at McGill University in Canada. He specializes in international relations, especially international security and South Asia. Welcome, Professor TV Paul. Thank you. Now, to start us off, how do you think the latest sanctions, both in terms of the scale and why they came about, compare with some of the more notable sanctions that the world has seen in the last 20 to 30 years? Well, these sanctions were um, um, in preparation for a long period of time, um, considering that um, uh, the the Western countries, the European countries, were not willing to go along with the U.S. for a period of time. But the Malaysian Airlines uh, downing really uh, uh, as a catalyst for um, Europeans to put their acts together. Uh, but the challenge here is whether they will work in the long run. And we can talk about the conditions under which sanctions work and if those conditions are met in this case. Mm, what do you think? Have they been met in this case? Not really, uh, because um, the, the, for sanctions to work, there are a number of uh, conditions, first of all, uh, the parties should have an asymmetrical relationship. Uh, in, in other words, uh, one should be hurt uh, more than the other. There should not be an alternative source of supply. Uh, no technology uh, s- uh, substitutability. You know, you don't, shouldn't get other uh, op- uh, other options. Uh, what you're losing, little international support for the target, uh, etc. And in this case. Um, Some of these conditions um, uh, probably partially meet, but uh, uh, they don't uh, in a general way because Russia still has friends, and uh, that includes China, uh, India, and many in Asia, and uh, even those European countries that are putting sanctions depend on Russia for energy supplies. Mm. In fact, some European countries have said that the sanctions could adversely affect businesses and people in the countries that impose the sanctions. Exactly. And uh, when the winter comes, uh, they will need the, the, the gas and the oil from Russia. And um, if they can find other substitutes easily, which are not going to be easy, I think oil prices could spike uh, if gas price also could spike if they don't uh, find the substitute. Um, suppliers. We'll talk about alternatives and also hark back to previous cases where sanctions indeed have been more effective when we continue in just a moment. Let's speak with Mr. Tan first. He's joined us on 669-11938. Hi, Mr. Tan. Good morning. Hi, morning, Bharti and Susan. 
Um, my view is uh, sanctions alone seem to have very limited uh, effectiveness. Uh, we can just take a look at uh, our, uh, a nearby example, the North Koreans. Uh, North Korea, I think they have uh, experienced sanctions uh, from the US and the international community for, for years. And yet, after, after such a long time, uh, it remains as defiant as ever. Uh, and from time to time, engaging in provocative actions uh, such as uh, firing missiles and so on and so forth. So I, I think sanctions alone uh, would have limited effectiveness unless it is coupled with uh, diplomacy. So in the case of Russia, uh, which is such a massive uh, economy that is plugged into the international community, it is difficult to uh, impose sanctions without experiencing uh, backlash uh, from such actions uh, in the form of uh, hurting the European economies as well. Mm. When you say diplomacy, that sanctions need to be coupled with diplomacy, how do you think that a, an effective strategy can be built around that concept? You see, uh, in the case of uh, sanctions coupled with diplomacy, uh, in this example, I think the U.S., and the uh, community and the international communities need to continuously uh, talk and cajole uh, Russia into going back to the right uh, uh, course of action. Uh, one successful, very successful example is Myanmar. You see, Myanmar has previously experienced uh, uh, sanctions uh, from the U.S. Uh, from uh, for for many years because of the way. Uh, the government has dictated over the rule of democracy and, and the uh, and the oppression that is felt by the people. But as part of the ASEAN bloc, because of the diplomacy that is engaged by the ASEAN uh, country, the members' country, eventually, I think the Myanmar government realized that it, it, it is uh, necessary to open up uh, and to engage in the proper course of action in order to benefit uh, its economy and its people as well. That's what I meant by, uh, you know, sanctions mm. coupled with diplomacy. To Thank you very much for that, Mr. Tan. Really appreciate your views on this. And we'll follow up on that in just a moment. Stay with us on Talk Back on 938 Live. Do sanctions work in getting countries and regimes that misbehave back in line? We're talking about this in the context of EU and US sanctions on Russia in the wake of the downing of flight MH17 and its actions in Crimea. We're talking today also with our expert who is joining us on the line. His name is T.V. Paul. He's an expert in international relations at the Department of Political Science at McGill University in Canada. Now, Professor Paul, let's respond to what our first caller, Mr. Tan, mentioned, that sanctions alone won't work. What we need is also diplomacy. However, this is a unique case. Give us some examples of cases where sanctions have worked effectively, why they worked in those cases and may not work in this particular case. Well, I think we have to look at uh, this case very differently. This, this is a, a, a great power, a wounded great power with a lot of pride. And its core security interests, as it is defined by the uh, elite that is Putin and his circle, include uh, what you call... Um, uh, uh, control over Ukraine and its future. And that has not been uh, uh, gone away, even if the rebels uh, lose this battle. What is happening is that it, is, uh, it has been long time making. The Russians feel they were treated rather poorly by the West after the, uh, after the Cold War ended. They expected to be treated similar to a great power, and the West um, offered them a lot of... Uh, initial um, uh, goodies, but then the um, United States obviously took over as the unipolar leader. And that is what is coming back. And Putin is trying to resurrect Russia as a great power. So, and as a respectable stakeholder, uh, differentiating from Western values, Western ideas, and also the fact that he wants to at least gain some of the lost uh, uh, near abroad uh, of the territory that Russia lost. Mm. I so could see that. that. However, will this type of action that is being condemned internationally really earn Russia that status of being a respectable power, which is what you say Putin is trying to do? Right, but they, they have a very poor PR at this point. Uh, public relations-wise, they have lost quite a bit, partly because of the, uh, the crude manner in which this annexation took place in Crimea and then uh, the um, support for the uh, 
Rebels and then now the downing of the Malaysian airliner. So, um, yes, to some extent. But Russia is uh, not uh, North Korea. Russia is not uh, Iran. Russia is, uh, is a major actor. And Russia is a, not Myanmar either. Yeah, exactly. And uh, even uh, look at those countries. They survived and they kept uh, fighting. And because it's the survival of the regime that is very crucial here. If Putin thinks that these sanctions are, um, uh, if he concedes, He's going to lose power or his prestige and his right now he has 80 percent popularity rating uh, that uh, then uh, he will be in deep trouble then he will not be in a position to concede that's why his security his regime security is very relevant here whether the sanctions will affect that i think uh, uh, time can only say whether the russian public will turn against him but he has brought a lot of things the russians value like pro- economic prosperity obviously crony capitalism, but uh, the point is that the country's um, economy uh, tripled or something like that during his, uh, you know, 10-year, 12-year mm. period. And so we are uh, talking at a, a leader who thinks as he's the resurrector, you know, one who is going to build it up. His ego is uh, online here, and the West is uh, trying to uh, believe that uh, it can be changed through this sort of uh, limited actions. Yes, it will hurt some segments of the economy, um, and uh, maybe uh, some individuals, but um, overall the country is too big, and it, it withstood. By the way, during the Cold War period, it, it was under sanctions. It was uh, containment was all about uh, not just military containment, economic containment. Mm. So, to what extent do you think, if sanctions were expanded, there could be enough of a hit on the Russian economy to make Putin come back in line? I mean, you said his career is built on e- the economic success of Russia. In the long term, could we see that be pulverized by and international the action? Pro- the problem is the international community is not unified us uh, on the subject. The Western countries are up to a point, but the, even they will, after a while, once they start realizing, they are right now fragile economies, the European economies, as you know, their growth rate is uh, slightly getting above, you know, 1% or something, and most of them have still major problems in terms of the economic crisis they went through. They, this will be a blow to them, too, if they lose uh, the, the Britain, for instance. You probably know that London has a big investment of Russian uh, expatriates and money. Mm. In and fact, uh, Europe-Russia trade is worth about 10 times yeah. that of U.S.-Russian trade. Yeah. In fact, British Foreign Minister Philip Hammond uh, told the BBC after the sanctions were announced that it would be absurd to suggest that we can impose wide-ranging sanctions on the Russian economy mm. without also having some impact on ourselves. Yeah. So if sanctions don't work, what's the alternative? We'll continue talking about that in just a while, right after news and sports. Call us 669 Thanks for joining us on Talkback. I'm Bharati Jagdish. Today, are sanctions the answer to getting countries that misbehave back in line? Or do they work at all? 669-11938 is our number. We're talking about this in the context of the downing of Malaysia Airlines flight MH17, refocusing the world's attention on the Ukraine crisis and the position that Russia has taken after its annexation of Crimea in March. The US and EU have introduced sanctions that target Russia Russia's banking, defense and energy sectors. But will they have any meaningful impact? Joining us today is Assistant Professor Evan Resnick. He's just joined us. He's coordinator of the United States program at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. On the phone is T.V. Paul, Professor of International Relations at the Department of Political Science at McGill University in Canada. Now, Evan, let's bring you into the discussion. T.V. Paul earlier said that Sanctions might have worked in other contexts against other countries. He mentioned Iran, Myanmar. But in this context, there is no way that they are going to have any meaningful impact on Russia because of its sheer international power and the way that many countries are dependent on it for resources. What's your take on this, though? One second, Evan. Let's turn your microphone on. Go ahead, Evan. Uh, I completely agree with Professor Paul's assessment. The sanctions are unlikely to... Uh, achieve their foremost aim of getting the Russians to stand down, withdraw from Ukraine, and uh, uh, or rather end the uh, the Russian government's support for the separatists. Be for two reasons. One is that 
Europe uh, needs to, uh, for the sanctions to work effectively, they have to target Russian oil and gas exports. And since Europe is so heavily dependent on those exports, it's very unlikely that they would ever agree to such draconian sanctions, which would hurt them as much, if not more, than the Russians would. And the other reason why Russia is unlikely to change its behavior dramatically in response to the sanctions is because Russia cares a lot more about the fate of Ukraine than does the United States or its allies in Western Europe. The, uh, Ukraine is a uh, is is considered critical by Russian national security policymakers to Russian uh, uh, security uh, vis-a-vis its adversaries in the West. So if sanctions don't work, what is the alternative? I should mention earlier, Mr. Tan, one of our callers said that diplomacy has to go hand in hand with sanctions. But will even that work? It might. Uh, it, it would have to involve a recognition on the part of the United States and its NATO allies in Europe that uh, they are unlikely to... Uh, there, there's no tool of statecraft that is uh, likely to... Uh, uh, convince the Russians to uh, to to uh, leave Ukraine, to abandon Ukraine uh, to the West, either to the EU or uh, or uh, to NATO. So there's there's very little in the way of viable options, uh, options that are at least cost effective. Uh, sh- the, the, the big option is, is the use of military force. And that, of course, would entail enormous risks, given that Russia is a nuclear power. Mm -hmm. So what's the alternative? If you have ideas, we want to hear from you. Peter joins us now on 669-11938. Hi, Peter. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Bharati and Sudan. Yes, what do you think, Peter? I I, I definitely, I look at the world now. I mean, this is my own own opinion, you know, especially when Russia annexed Crimea. And I remember 20 years ago, somebody read a book or something like that, The Coming World Blackout and the future survival. For Russia to be sanctioned, like what your guest speaker say, there is no way out. Simple, they are coming back to become the superpower. And what else more, with the West, NATO, their power, most likely the world knows are declining also. That's the reason they just march into Crimea without a shot fire. That's why when our Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister said Singapore will still prosper and rosy, you know, in any kind of walk of life or business. But in the event of global crisis, this is what we are seeing before our very eyes. I hope it won't happen. But looking at what political leaders are doing, sometimes I say to myself, there are madness in their heart, that's all. Thank you very much for that, Peter. Appreciate your views on this. Let's talk about the whole culture of brinkmanship here. Surely it has to be contained up to a point. But can the line really be drawn so clearly, Evan? Well, uh, if the U.S. and the West engages in brinkmanship with uh, the Russians, and they have to a degree uh, over the the Ukraine crisis, then they have to realize that ultimately... They, they they hold weaker cards than the Russians do. The balance of interests, in other words, uh, who cares more about the fate of Ukraine, the West or Russia, is a loss to the, to the West. The Russians care far more about Ukraine than they do, and are the, and uh, Moscow will there thereby be willing to take far greater risks in order to uh, d- defend its interests in, UK, in in Ukraine against the West. So I think brinkmanship. Up to, I think uh, uh, punishing Russia for, be, for, for, for its aggressive behavior vis-a-vis Ukraine is fine and appropriate, but I think the West has to be very sober in its uh, assessment of how much it can get from the Russians in terms of compliance with its greater objectives, given how strongly the Russians feel about Ukraine. Mm, and also, sanctions have in the past been shown to, in fact, harden the stance of the regime rather than have them comply with whatever the world order is. Given us a call 669-11938. We've got Mr. Ng joining us now. Hi, Mr. Ng. Hi, morning. Yes. What do you think, yeah. Mr. Ng? Okay. Um, sanctions cut both ways. Yeah. Um, it affects the the target country. It affects the partners that deal with the partner country. And the countries but, uh, that impose the sanctions. Yes. Yes. Correct. I mean, uh, Singapore is, is the hub of uh, uh, trading, and we trade different commodities, we ship different commodities as well. We definitely deal with uh, sanctioned parties, you know, 
Russia, unfortunately, whether it's sanctioned or not at the moment, in time to come, we'll know. But it affects everybody. And uh, I mean, the, the way my suggestion is that the, the sanction has to be very targeted. It cannot be sanctioning a country because there are many innocent parties within a country. There are people holding the passports that are not you know, related to the crimes that the, you know, whichever party uh, commits. Thank you very much, Mr. Ng, for bringing that up. So do sanctions only really serve to hurt innocent citizens of the country that is sanctioned? Let's bring TV Paul into this. What do you think, Professor? What is the alternative to sanctions? Well, I think the alternative is to, first of all, there are big questions involved in it. Russia wants status, equal status with the West. Russia does not want the West to interfere in its near abroad. And Russia, Russia wants... Um, the West to treat it as an equal partner, as it used to in the Cold War period. And what the sanctions are sending a symbolic message saying that you are a regional power, inferior power. And that is the big challenge here. How do you get this country and Putin to realize that they are a regional power if uh, that's the case, which I doubt it. What I approach to diplomacy would you suggest? I think that the, the time has come uh, for diplomacy not directly by the United States because I think the U.S. is very unpopular with uh, Putin and company right now. Uh, maybe a third party should involve, try to see what are the red lines they really um, are, uh, you know, agreeable to both sides. If the Russian red lines are crossed, uh, at least what they realize, um, then uh, it'll be hard for them to sit down. But one thing I noticed, at least the last uh, recent news, is that the rebels are losing many parts of uh, their control. If that happens, and the Russians probably then will have a, a, a possibility of talking to them whether an autonomous uh, creation of an autonomy arrangement will be satisfactory for the parties involved. And if so, and then uh, Russia agreeing that that autonomy uh, will be maintained uh, by the international community. But I think, the, I think the problem with the West is West is pushing hard for Ukraine's membership in uh, EU and then potentially NATO. All this really affect the way Russia sees the world. It's a geopolitical view they have. It is not a liberal view. The West sees it as a liberal uh, an increase of the liberal space. And for the Russians, that is not actually. It is the West encroaching upon its uh, territorial sphere. So there has to be a recognition by the West that this idea of uh, expansion of the liberal community, liberal world order, may have limits, at least for in terms of uh, the spheres of influence are concerned. Mm. What do you think, Evan? Is a paradigm shift needed in the West here that can perhaps bring about a better approach to diplomacy with a country like Russia, perhaps a more carrot approach as well, rather than just using the stick? And not merely a carrot approach, but an approach to, again, this is sort of follows directly from what Professor Paul just said, an approach that recognizes that other great powers have spheres of influence. Yeah. That, uh, for, again, to, uh, to parrot Professor Paul, uh, for the U.S., it's you know, the, the expansion of, of liberal democracy, of market capitalism, is sort of the, uh, viewed as the natural progression of things. It's not viewed in geopolitical terms. Uh, but rather, from the, from Moscow's perspective, it very much is that Ukraine is considered a necessary, and the rest of the near abroad, the former Soviet states, are considered to be uh, uh, an integral uh, protective belt uh, for uh, a country that has been invaded from the West multiple times in its history, uh, suffered greatly as a result. And so I think to some extent, the West has to, and, and particularly the United States, has to cope with the notion that uh, it, 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 sometimes, sometimes the U.S. doesn't view uh, its actions as being expansionist and 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 offensive vis-a-vis -vis others, but uh, they tend to be viewed as such by adversaries such as Russia or say China. Uh, so, uh, some solution to this problem might involve something akin to sort of the Finlandization of Ukraine. Mm. Uh, what, what 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 sort of the Finland status in the Cold War was basically to. Uh, 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 con uh, allowed the Soviet Union to control its foreign policy uh, even as it was permitted the domestic autonomy to pursue uh, uh, you know, uh, liberal democracy, uh, a capitalist uh, economy. So uh, the West might have to acknowledge some sort of similar arrangement with Ukraine that 
uh, Ukraine would have to forfeit its uh, uh, much of its foreign policy to uh, Russia in, in exchange for some degree of domestic autonomy. Mm. So some acknowledgement of the fact, like you said, that these nations have their own spheres of influence, some recognition of that fact. And that also is likely to make a leader like Vladimir Putin perhaps sit back and say, OK, at least there's an acknowledgement of that as well. So while we talked about the ineffectiveness of sanctions... Is it better to still have them than not have them at all? I, I think so. I think that, that, that the international community can't just sit back and allow uh, a, a resurgent great power to uh, begin invading uh, the territory of sovereign states. Yes, exactly. So there needs to be some, uh, some, some signal, some costly signal of disapprobation with that behavior. And so sanctions, I think the sanctions that the U.S. and the EU have uh, implemented uh, since the in, since the since the initial Russian foray into Crimea are are, are quite reasonable and uh, given that you're dealing with a country that is relatively powerful in military terms compared to its neighbors and possess still possesses thousands of nuclear weapons it is a nuclear it continues to be a nuclear superpower if not an economic or mil, or, or conventional military one that uh, co- that country needs to be dealt with. Uh, to a certain extent, with, with with velvet gloves, you don't want to uh, uh, you know you don't want a, a second Cuban Missile Crisis to break out. Mm. You also don't want to be cowed into submission and intimidation through intimidation. Exactly. That's that. That's that's the other side of this: is that the West can't be seen as uh, as appeasing Moscow, uh, mm-hmm. especially with such a na- sort of this uh, brutal and sort of a, a naked power grab. So there has to be some re- retaliatory response, some punishment, but a cognizance that ultimately. The West cares less about the fate of Ukraine than Moscow does for good reason. Now, I want to bring this back to Singapore, our context. For a smaller country like Singapore, which has always supported the larger multilateral system, how would it approach the use of unilateral sanctions in such circumstances? Given that Singapore is so trade dependent, sanctions are, uh, it's given that the Singaporean economy is small in relative terms and that the economy is so heavily dependent on trade, sanctions are, uh, are, are a problem. And they uh, unilateral sanctions would be, fo- you know, a, a, irrespective of who they're levied against. Uh, would be cons- would would be considered for a country with Singapore's uh, economy to be problematic. Um, broad multilateral uh, so UN sanctioned sanctions would probably be uh, those that the Singaporean uh, government would be more inclined to uh, uh, to accept and participate in sanctions with broad international legitimacy and uh, cooperation. Uh, TV Paul, your last word on this. Moving forward, what is the strategy you would recommend? Well, right now the sanctions are needed because the West has to show some level of uh, unhappiness uh, through uh, coordinated action. Um, I don't think they can sustain it for too long, unless, of course, more precipitating actions come from uh, Moscow or from the rebels. Um, What is needed is, uh, I think, diplomacy, uh, as one of the callers said, has to be given a lot more uh, importance. And this is where the Germans used to do that during the Cold War period, you know, and that kind of leadership is needed, um, perhaps from a third party, uh, connecting these When you say third party, who would you recommend in this case? Well, that's the thing. It has to be, used to be UN, but in this case, uh, UN is in really bad shape with uh, not a very effective Secretary General, so... uh, Who is second best? Second best could be uh, an internationally recognized um, figure, and uh, that could be Bill Clinton, I don't know, <laughs> someone like that, mm. or Jimmy Carter. You know, people who uh, can talk to the Russians and the Americans and see what um, will be satisfactory to both sides, at least to preserve uh, independence of uh, Ukraine with some autonomous status. I agree with uh, Resnick's point that um, um, Ukraine is seeking too much, uh, too fast. Um, it is actually a, a, a secondary power, you know, very much in the sphere of Russia. And uh, we have to somehow give the Ukrainians an understanding that what happened in Eastern Europe uh, need not be replicated in certain core areas of uh, Russian uh, periphery. And this is one of them. Thank you very much, TV Paul. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. TV Paul, Professor of International Relations at the Department of Political Science at McGill University. And joining us in the studio this morning was ass- Assistant Professor Evan Resnick, coordinator of the U.S. program at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. Many thanks also for all your phone calls this morning.